They do a great job, don't they? So when I was younger, I had an anger problem. Just in all honesty, I was, I was young and I was angry. But in, but in Texas, they got a thing for that. It's called high school football. And so, okay, we got some football. Okay, we got some Brandeis or O'Connor people in the house. All right, all right, all right. Panthers? Well, say what? Oh, there they are. Okay. And so I, I was, I played high school football. I, 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 there, I was there. I made it. I, I, I worked really hard to get there too. I was like the little kid, the younger one, and then I became the fat kid, and I finally made the spotlight. So there I was at the Astrodome. 24 5A state semifinal playoffs. And I was a defensive tackle. And I had anger problems. And I was there and I was so excited to be there because this was going to be the game right before the championship. And I get there and I'm so jazzed and fired up. And then from the very start of the first play, the running back is running his mouth at me. And I am running my mouth at him. And I won't tell you what we said because we're at church. But I was like, I'm coming for you, and it's going to be bad, and I'm going to do all that I can to knock you out. And so I, you know, I had all these anger problems and all these issues and all this frustration. And the first, second quarter goes, great, we're up. And it goes into the third quarter, halftime happens, and we start the third quarter. And I remember exactly what happened. I got down in my power stance. You know this one? Defensive tackle, I'm looking at the guard, I see the, the movement, the shift, it was a 29 toss to the outside, simple play if you know football, and I threw the guard and I began to abandon the A gap, I knew the A gap was good, it was fine, I was going to go to the outside, I was going to sack this running back in the, in the backfield. And I chase him. I run as fast as I can run. I'm talking my top speed. I am fully extended running as fast as I can run. And then I see the running back pitch the ball. And some of you know football. You know what's happening. It was a reverse. 29,000 people yell, reverse. I'm running as fast. Stop. Turn. That's all I remember. Because there, a 270-pound full-grown man who probably failed three or four years and was still allowed to play high school football was running as fast as he could run, who also had anger problems. He hits me right in my ear hole. I remember none of this. But for two weeks, all my coaches could do was hit stop and rewind and watch Volkmer, who was the loudmouth, angry kid, do a double somersault and collapse into a pile of broken human flesh. I don't remember any of it. In fact, all I remember was boom, just a huge hit. And I, somehow, I woke up in this weird world. It was just swirling, and all of a sudden, everything came into focus, and I see my dad's face. He found me amidst 20,000 people. He's face to face with me, and they got the salts for my nose, and I'm really awake. Okay, I'm awake, and my only memory of the event was my dad saying, good job. Watch out for the reverse. Yeah. So, happy Father's Day, Dad. I'll watch out for the reverse. And that's when I realized there's a time to encourage, and then there's a time to warn. And we would be wise to hear the warnings and instructions of our Father. Amen? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, all jokes and funny stories aside, we thank you for your encouragement and your warnings in scriptures. Help us, Lord to embrace them and live them out. Help us to encourage and warn one another as we see the day approaching. Amen. Turn in your Bibles to the New Testament. We're going to be going over many of the passages where Paul tells us to encourage and admonish one another. Turn in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. We're going to be reading in the 5th chapter and the 11th verse, and I'll start. 
Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up just as, in fact, you are doing. I'll say it again. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up just, in fact, as you are so doing. Now, if you know the background of the Thessalonican church, they've got problems. They've got issues. There's a doctrinal controversy that's running rampant amidst the church. And what was Paul's advice? Encourage one another. Wow. Half the church was believing that the day of the Lord, that Jesus had already returned. Don't you think that would bring some confusion? Yes. So this, in Paul's response, encourage one another. Build each other up, just as in fact you are already doing. Keep going. Keep encouraging one another. This begins to be Paul's mantra throughout his epistles. Turn with me to Colossians. It's another book in the New Testament. It's one of Paul's letters to the church of Colossae. Verse, chapter 4, verse 8. I am sending him to you for this very purpose, that he may know the circumstances and comfort your heart. That word for comfort is also the word encourage, which in the Greek means parakaleo. Now, you're going to hear that word often, this sermon, parakaleo, and it's because it is the Greek word for encouragement. And when I began to study and define what this word means, it really turned me uh, for a loop. I really had to go to a lot of different books to get a, a different understanding because it had nine definitions. Yeah, nine separate definitions for the word encouragement. Now, when we think encouragement, we think of someone writing a little no note or, oh, thank you, great sermon pastor. Or, you know, we think of, you know, it's Father's Day. Dads, you're going to get some text messages and some, some notes maybe scribbled with crayon. I'll probably get some that are misspelled because I have a five and a seven-year-old, but that's okay. I, I don't know if I could really spell myself. I'm dyslexic. So. But we think of encouragement. But rather, the New Testament concept for encouragement is that of parakaleo. And this was Paul's advice. Turn in Ephesians 4, 15 through 16, and then we'll bring the slide back up. But speaking the truth in love, that we may grow up into things into him who is the head, Christ. From whom the whole body, joined and knit together by, by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. So this is what Paul is advising us. Every one of us has a role in parakaleo. All of us have a role in encouragement. That means that simply, what if this wasn't the only sermon you heard today? What if you heard an encouraging word, a parakaleo, both in small groups and in your one-on-one -on -one? What if somebody met you at the door and encouraged you at the outside of the cafe? What if in the parking lot we were parakaleoing each other? You know, what if that was the words that we were saying? What if we were encouraging one another? Let every person do their part. Every part does a share which causes a mutual growth for the edification of the whole body. What if encouragement was a weapon? What if encouragement was the way that we combated forces of darkness? What if encouragement was a way that we combated doctrinal divisions? What if we learned to en encourage one another? You see, each one of these colors represents a hue, a different way. Because when I thought encouragement, I always thought just saying something nice about someone. But what I realized is that the Christian concept of encouragement is whatever is needed at the time for that person to look and talk and act like Jesus. You see, that's a wider view of encouragement than just a kind, kind, nice word. But rather, it is what's needed to make this person look and talk and act like Jesus. And we all have a role to play in this. It's not the pastor's responsibility to parakaleo. It's all of our responsibility. It is a mutually joined and shared thing that builds the entire body of Christ into looking and talking like Jesus. So what is whatever is needed in the time? Because this is why it's important. Because a vast majority of Christians will go through periods of discouragement. You've been there, friends? You've been there? When you didn't want to get out of bed, when you couldn't lift your head, how much more important it is 
in a time of ever-increasing darkness that the church can rise up and encourage one another. One of my friends and mentors, Winky Pratney, says this, the devil cannot get to you unless he can discourage you. How much more important is encouragement? If the only way that the enemy can get to us is through discouragement, how we should encourage one another. We need encouragement. I think of the story of Christopher Columbus, as simple as it was. When did he sail the ocean blue, kids? There's hope for America. The education system still works. Yes, so, you know, Christopher started with the Nina, the Pinta, the Santa Maria, and he was trying to do something no one had ever done. He was crossing the Atlantic Ocean, and for 60 days, they saw no evidence of land at all. Can you imagine being on a boat for 60 days and not seeing land? I get seasick sometimes at Port Aransas when we've gone out for like two hours. Can you imagine being on a boat for 60 days? The crew began to be despondent and frustrated and angry and even superstitious. We're going to fall off the edge of the world. They didn't know it was a globe. Some people still don't know that. That was a joke. Uh, they begin to be superstitious. There's going to be sea monsters. And to the point where let's have faith. Columbus is saying let's have faith. Let's, let's trust we will reach the new world. But he, the crew got to the point where they made him promise. You got three days, Chris. You got three days. And if we don't see land or any sign of land, we're going to turn this thing east. And it, we're going east. And if you want to go with us, it's the only boat. <laughs> we're going east. And then they began to fast and pray. And they see a bird, an unusual bird. Now that for me... Unless it was like an ostrich, it doesn't really do anything for me. It doesn't really motivate or encourage me, but they keep going. And on the third day, they see a branch filled with berries floating in the water, in the waves. And one of the sailors reaches down and they grab this branch and they hold it up and they're so excited because what does this mean? Land is close. So they take this branch and they put it on the very front of the ship and they tie it up as a symbol of encouragement, a symbol to keep going. And then they discovered the greatest discovery, the new world. And all they needed to accomplish their mission was encouragement. Oh, the importance of encouragement. Let me tell you the story of a famous mission tale, the story of the Lone Star Mission. For 36 years, missionaries labored in southern India, and they received no converts, no salvations, and no success. Now, one of the things you do as a missionary is you write newsletters. What would you write after the, about the 15th year of nothing happening? Well, business as usual. Thank you for your money. God bless. 36 years, no salvation, no church, no, no regeneration, no new birth, nothing but labor. To the point where the mission board retracted the missionaries and told them to come back to London. They come to London, and they're all discouraged. Everyone's discouraged. The pastor, the missionaries, the mission boards, and they think it's been an utter failure. They literally said, we're going to close the mission. It was a time of defeat. That night, a one man in particular, his name was S.F. Smith, who wrote My Country, Tis of Thee. He was there, and he was burdened. He, didn't, he, he knew that they should close the mission, but he didn't want to. He just had a desperate hope, and he wrote a song. As the Lord impressed upon him a song in his heart. Shine on, Lone Star, thy radiance bright shall spread o'er all the eastern sky. Morn breaks apace from gloom and night. Shine on and bless the pilgrim's eye. This old hymn became a rallying cry among the pastors and the missionaries to the people who in a time of desperation when there was no hope and there was no success, it rallied the people and rallied the funds and other workers began and came and they all uh, went to the southern coast of India and it began to be one of the greatest revivals in the history of India. In a time of complete despair, all these people needed 
was encouragement. Parakaleo, what was needed at the time. The primary means of encouragement to the church is the word of God. I'll say that again. The primary way that we encourage one another, it's not our own thoughts or our own opinions, but rather the scriptures. Paul tells us in Ephesians in the fourth chapter, but speaking the truth in love. It is the scriptures that are supposed to be spoken and encourage one another. Paul tells us in Titus in the first chapter that we're to hold fast the faithful word as it has been taught that we may be able, all of us, may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort, that's parakaleo, and convict those who contradict. He tells us once again in 2 Timothy that we're to preach the word. We're to be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, and exhort, that's parakaleo, with all long suffering and with all teaching. The two areas, the fundamental areas that Christians and our church need to understand and be encouraged in understanding are these two concepts. We need to know who Jesus is, and we need to know who we are. The church needs to have a proper understanding of Jesus Christ. That's called Christology. We need to know that Jesus Christ is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, who will come to judge both the quick and the dead. That he is the bread of life. That he's a sinner's savior. That he is the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. We need to have a proper understanding of who Jesus is. Because from a proper understanding of Christology, it will lead to a proper understanding of identity. We need to know who we are also. And when we understand who he is, it helps us understand who we are. Because the Bible says, as he is, so are we in this world. The Bible says that we are seated with him in heavenly places. That we're co-heirs with Christ. That we're to adopt his mission, his character, and his attitude. You see, that's why Christology leads to identity. And that doesn't come from your own understanding, but rather from the scriptures. So the primary means of encouragement of parakaleo is the word of God. Now, that's the good news. The sermon is encouragement and admonishment. Now, to admonish, that's an old King James word. What does that mean? Very simply, it means to warn. Why should we warn? Very simply, turn on the news. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 through 25. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, parakaleoing one another, and so much more as you see the day approaching. My friends, this is the end time strategy of the church encouragement when the world will continue to increase in lawlessness and lasciviousness it'll in continue increase and in all kinds of wickedness the love of many will grow cold but we encourage one another all the more as you see the day approaching the day is approaching my friends jesus it tells us in Matthew in the 24th tra chapter, his disciples say, Rabbi, what will be the sign of your coming? He said, you will be hated by all for my name's sake. Did you know that in this time, right now, currently, right now in 2019, is the greatest persecution on the global church of Christianity? Never in the history of Christianity has the church been globally persecuted as it is right now. We are blessed to live in a country that is protected it might not always be the case, friends. You will be hated by all for my name's sake. Two couple sentences later, and many will be offended. Did you ever catch that in Matthew 24? When we think of the end of time, we always think of signs and the heavens and the stars and the moon turning to blood and the stars falling. And all of those things are rightfully so. There will be signs in the heavens, but many people will be offended. You think people are offended nowadays? They got a word for it, triggered. This is a snowflake generation. Yeah. It's funny, but you keep your eyes up 
as you see the day approaching. And remember, our response is not to do what the world says and just talk over each other like those talking heads on the news. But rather, our end time response is that of encouraging one another as you see the day approaching. Paul tells us in Colossians in the third chapter, Let the words of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing. That word is warning. We're to warn one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in our hearts to the Lord. And now... My life verse, Colossians chapter 1, verses 28 through 29. Him we preach, warning every man. Him we preach, warning every man. And teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. To this end I also labor and striving according to his working which works in me mightily. Did you catch that? Who, do we to, who are we to warn? Every man. Who are we to teach? Every man. That we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Paul says to this end I labor and strive mightily. And there's a power that works in me to accomplish this. And so when I hear people saying, well, well we're not perfect. The church isn't perfect. I say, well, Paul says we got work to do. We're to present every man perfect, complete, mature, into the full measure of Jesus Christ. And we're to warn every man But friends, this is not what's happening. People are not warning one another. They're not. And the people that are warning, the culture is totally oblivious to it. So there I was. This nice widow, had. she was really nice. She was my friend. She asked me to help her with her her dryer. I was going to help her plug it in. And you know, every time you move from one place to the other, it's always the wrong cord. It's the three, pol- three prong or four prong, but wherever you move, it's the opposite one. And so I go and I help this lady. I change out the cord. It's rather simple. And on the back of that dryer, I knew what it said. There's a huge sign. Do not work on the dryer while it's plugged in. The old sign. I build houses. I can help. I, blah, 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 blah. I plug that dryer in. And I, everything's great. I'm adjust- putting it back into the smallest cabinet known to man. And it won't fit. I, I got to adjust it. I try to climb over the back of the dryer to try to, you know, scooch it back. That's when I felt what eternity is like. <laughs> 220 volts coursed through my body. I literally go outside and I sit down. And the first thing that comes into my mind was a sign. A song that I learned when I was in the eight years old. If you know this song, it's Louis the Lightning Bug. He comes on the public service announcements and he tells you. He sings a little song. You got to obey what the signs say. This is the first thing that came into my mind. Now, whether it was the electricity or whether it was God, what time will tell. But it got me thinking. You have to obey what the signs say. Signs, warnings. Have you received warnings and instructions from your friends? From the word of God? From the church of God? Have you been warned? Because the sins of the pulpit are the sins of the land. The failures to warn will flush itself out in the society that we live in. We are to be the salt of the earth, which is the preservation of society. We are to be the light of the world, to shine in the darkness. You see this? We have a responsibility to warn. But with that, we also have the responsibility to be wise and heed warning when we ourselves are warned. And there seems to be a willingness to warn but not receive Listen, friends, to Proverbs in the 15th chapter. The ear that hears the rebuke of life will abide among the wise. Faithful, in Proverbs in the 27th chapter, chapter, faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. That means this, if you have a friend in your life who loves you enough to tell you the truth, 
The stuff that you don't want to hear, you need to embrace that friend and kiss them and hug them and let them know that they care for your soul. Because we live in a day of flattery and vanity. And if you have someone who loves you enough to warn you and admonish you, you be wise enough to receive it. David tells us, let the righteous strike me. It shall be as kindness and let him rebuke me. It shall be as an excellent oil. Let my head not refuse it for still my prayers against the deeds of the wicked. That basically means this, that correction and warning and admonishment is for your good. It's for your good. And so that you look like Jesus. But there's reasons why we don't warn, isn't there? Because encouragement comes easier. Like, I could write a note. I could incur. I could paracaleo. Right? We're all like, yeah, sign me up. But when it comes for admonishment, it's like, anybody volunteer for the admonishment committee? Nobody. It's like Kyle. I'll be there. Because I understand this. I understand this. It doesn't hurt your relationship. It actually helps it. If you love someone enough to tell them the truth, there actually something spiritual happens and they go, thank you for telling me that. I needed to hear about that. I didn't want to listen, but what you said is important. Heed the instruction. Heed the admonishment. It doesn't hurt the relationship. It actually helps it. Now, Paul tells us in Romans, in the the 15th chapter, that there's a prerequisite for admonishment. That this is not to be done carelessly. But there's conditions that need to be met before we warn. Romans in the 15th chapter. Now I myself am confident concerning you, my brethren, that you are full of all goodness and filled with all knowledge, able to admonish, able to warn. Did you catch that? Knowledge and goodness. One of the main reasons that many of us don't warn or don't admonish is because we personally are dealing with something here. And we feel muzzled and choked. Well, how can I say anything about you when I personally am dealing with this? And that's why Jesus says, first remove the log from your own eye. Then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. But we're not supposed to walk around with beams in our head. We're supposed to have a clean heart and a pure life. You see, goodness is a prerequisite for warning. You see this? It's from a, it's the, the clean conscience which able to liberate us to minister effectively and warn people. We're supposed to minister from a pure heart and a clean life. And that will give us the right spirit and the right motive. And that's why Paul says day and night, day and night, he says this to the Ephesian church. For three years, day and night, in Acts in the 20th chapter, I did not cease to warn you, admonish you with tears. Tears. And it takes a stubborn and prideful heart to resist a correction of a tear-filled friend. But we, in this dark hour, we must learn to labor like this. To warn people with tears of their sinful ways and their sinful lifestyles. I know there's many fathers in the room and some of you have children and your children are wayward. And your responsibility is to try tears. Let them see your pain. And not just give your opinion. For the scriptures say all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof and correction and instructions in all righteousness. Paul says, I did not write these things to you to shame you, but as my beloved children, I warn you. Would you stand with me? Very simply, very practically this. Very simple, very practical. Do not encourage someone who needs to be warned. And do not warn someone who needs to be encouraged. But the Holy Spirit will help you. He is the helper. He will bring to your mind, this is our challenge for the week, a person that you need to encourage, that you could 
speak life into their situation, that, that there might be grace for the hearer, that, that you can literally speak an encouraging word to the point where they would be edified and to the full measure and stature of Jesus Christ. And then on the same way, there's a person in your life that you need to admonish, you need to warn. You might be the only person that stands between that person and hell. And it, you need to operate from that mindset. Lord, I'm here. I'm willing and able. Just give me some courage to say the words. Don't let me overspeak. Don't let me overstep. But God, give me courage to speak to this person. And he that hears the words of rebuke, heareth life. So as a church, we're going to take this time and we're going to ask the Holy Spirit to bring to our minds and our hearts two people. Who do we need to encourage? And who do we need to warn? And then we're going to be faithful to what the Lord reveals to us this week and we will encourage and we will warn. Let's pray. We're grateful, Lord, for all of your encouragement. That you're cheering us on. As we see the day approaching, Lord, we're praying for your kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven. Help us to labor to accomplish it. Let us be hearers of the word and doers. Let us hear your word and put it into practice. Let us encourage one another onto good works as we see the day approaching. But let us have the courage to warn. Let us have the courage to speak truth in a dark hour and miss a society that hates the truth and hates the light. Let us have gentleness and love and tears in our correction, but boldness to honor you. For I shun not to declare righteousness to the congregation. Amen. Holy, 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 that 
Church family, I love you guys. We love you guys. We're praying that you would be obedient to this call, that we as a church would be willing to encourage and admonish one another, that we would be willing to accept encouragement and to accept admonishment. Proverbs says that only the fool despises correction. I pray that we would walk in humility as we seek to know who to encourage and who to admonish. We love you guys. Bless you. Happy Father's Day. Have a wonderful weekend. You guys are dismissed.